Good morning, everyone. Happy Tuesday. We're back on Tuesday with So What? I hope you're having a great day. Um, I thought it would be a good time to revisit uh, cleaning your sewing room with, you know, it being spring, although outside of my window, it looks like winter because, again, we are having snow. Are you all getting tired of me saying that? I mean, it's kind of crazy. Um, but anyways, I'm still in the spring cleaning mood. Um, I am kind of a cleaning freak. Um, you wouldn't really know it by the state of my sewing room most days. Um, but I drive my family crazy with my attempt at cleanliness. Um, it's very difficult with three children and a large dog, but you know, we do what we can. So I thought today we would talk about cleaning our sewing room, kind of refreshing things, organizing ourselves so we can kind of take inventory of the fabrics in our stash, how we can use them in projects moving forward, um, and in general, maintaining our machine. So some of you may recall, we had Eric Drexler on as a guest quite a few So What's ago, uh, but it was one of our most popular So What episodes to date. Eric is a sewing machine repairman and has been working on all kinds of different sewing machine brands throughout his career. So it was great to have him on and talk to us about how to maintain our machine and what happens when we don't maintain our machine. So I think that's why that episode was so popular because Eric shared with us all kinds of different photos of sort of disaster machines where people are wondering why their machine isn't sewing anymore. Um, and turns out there was just tons of thread up in the motor even had gotten in there into crevices and places that you can't see to the naked eye. So Eric shared with us a bunch of these sort of horror stories. Um, and of course, he was able to help most of those people and still does to this day. Um, but, you know, very important to take our machine to the dealer. If you didn't buy your machine from a dealership, you can still go to a sewing machine uh, store shop and ask them if they will service your machine. It's very important to do this on a yearly basis, maybe even more if you use your machine, uh, you know, daily, uh, just to make sure that it's going to continue running like it should. Um, you know, these are our precious investments, so we need to take care of them just like we would service our car. We need to service our sewing machine. So at the end of that episode with Eric, <laughs> um, he shared some, let's say, not so appetizing. Um, that's kind of the wrong word. Um, some frightening stories about pets kind of interfering with our sewing and things we may not, um, know our pets are even doing cats in particular. At any rate, if you would like to go watch that, so what it is on our YouTube channel and you can find it. It's called sewing machine maintenance. Um, so you can watch and listen of, um, all these stories and I'm, kind of alluding to. At any rate, at the end of the episode, I decided one of our tutorials coming up needed to be a sewing machine cover. So your sewing machine may have come with a cover. A lot of the times they are like a hard plastic cover. Um, I actually keep that in my closet in the box that the sewing machine came in. Um, because for the most part, I'm using my machine on a daily basis. However, every night I have a cloth cover that I drape over it. This protects it from dust. Um, I, my studio is in my basement. So sometimes I get lovely spiders, um, and things like that. So I want to protect my machine from 
let's say, strange elements that could occur without my knowledge. So I have a cloth cover that I created. So I decided to jazz up that cover and give you all a tutorial for how to make a really pretty one that has an embroidered pocket. Um, pockets are just essential. Am I right? I mean, I hate it when I'm wearing clothes without pockets. So I thought, let's add a pocket to the cover. You could put your current supplies for the project you're working on, whether that's a thread spool, a specialty scissor, um, a ruler, a rotary cutter in that pocket. And then when you go on to your next project, you can swap out those items and you have all of your things right there at hand on your sewing machine cover. So I'm going to go over the entire tutorial today. I also posted the link to our blog, um, excuse me, to our free project page, which has a, t a PDF download for the entire project if you want to print it out or save it to your computer to reference later. So I'm going to give you the general overview of how to create this. And then, like I said, you can refer to that later. So a lot of you uh, coming on and saying hello. Good morning to all of you. Oh, some of you are saying you also have snow. Yep. March and April are our snowiest months here, so we should really expect it. But it's still kind of shocking um, to have all this snow as we are approaching the end of April. It's kind of crazy. Okay, so before we get to the tutorial, I want to go over a few things that you might find useful when you're doing your spring clean out of your sewing room and maintaining your sewing machine. So I'm going to start with our giveaway today. Uh, every time we do a Sew What, we have a giveaway for all of you newbies out there joining us. If you're new to Sew What, give me a thumbs up. Um, let's see. Our giveaway today is a bobbin cleaner tool and it's available at sulky.com. It looks like this. Now, basically you hold that little top area in your hand and that long piece can reach into your bobbin case area and clean out any stray threads, things of that nature. So it has a particular shape that fits that area of your bobbin. So really nice to think about all of those nooks and crannies that we can't reach and can't see. Use this bobbin cleaner tool. This is the giveaway today. It's valued at $14.95. So to be eligible for the giveaway, all you have to do is like the Sulky Facebook page. Most of you probably have already. Give me a thumbs up, some kind of emoji, comment, share. All of those types of engagements will make you eligible for the gifty. And I will pick the winner in about 24 hours. I usually do it the afternoon following the live um, show to give everybody a chance to kind of watch it throughout the day. So that is today's giveaway and the first thing I wanted to talk about as far as maintaining and cleaning up your sewing machine. Another thing, this is a new and improved product at sulky.com. Now, depending on your machine model, it may not be recommended to oil your machine yourself. Some of the fancy dancy machines actually say, do not oil this machine yourself. When you take it in for your yearly service, the technician will make sure all the right parts are lubricated and ready to go. However, if you have a different brand of machine that recommends that you oil it, maybe it came with a little tiny little bottle of oil, Welcome to this brand new, new and improved oil pen. As you can see, it has a really long, thin tube that dispenses the oil. So you can get into those little areas much easier. You don't have a lot of spillage um, and, you know, needing to wipe down the areas that you can't even reach with your fingers. So this is a really cool oil pen, very inexpensive. So add it to your cart with some other items that we're talking about today. Ooh, I also wanted to mention, before I forget, 
Our sale today, we've got 25% off lots and lots of stuff. 12 weight cotton petites thread, solids and blendables, single samplers and slim lines. Also stick and stitch and Fabrisolvi stabilizers and the sulky empty slim line boxes. I'm going to be talking about those in just a moment. So 25% off all these great products. You don't need a coupon code. Just head on over to sulky.com and you will get those deals. All right. Back to the maintaining of our machines. Beth says, these tools sound amazing. Just you wait, Beth. Just you wait. <laughs> All right, so this is actually one of our most popular items at Sulky. One of our popular notions, I should say, because obviously thread and stabilizer is where it's at. However, this, it's only $1. $1 gets you this fabulous lint brush. Now. I told you I'm a little bit of a cleaning freak and the little tiny little brush that comes with your sewing machine probably needs replacing or it's not large enough to fit in those little nooks and crannies. You might actually be shoving the lint farther into your machine at times if you're using that little short brush. This one, what I love about it is it has this longer sort of pipe cleaner-ish end to it, and you can get that into under your feed dogs and actually push the lint out towards your bobbin case out of your machine rather than pushing it farther into your machine. So this is a really cool lint brush. I thought you would all enjoy hearing about it. Okay, now don't get me wrong on the canned air. I know do not use canned air inside your machine. Whether you are cleaning out your serger or cleaning out your regular sewing machine, we do not want to blow the canned air in and underneath our machine because of what I just said. That actually pushes the dirt and dust farther into places that you really won't be able to reach. But I love some canned air for cleaning off my uh, uh, what's it called? The presser foot ankle. That's what it's called. So sometimes I'm working with specialty threads like sulky filane, which is hundred percent acrylic or 30 weight cotton. These threads, when you're embroidering with them or sewing at a fast speed can produce a little bit of lint. So what I do is I take the entire ankle that's holding my presser foot off of the machine and spray it with the canned air and then wipe it off with a dust cloth and it's good to go. I find that when I'm just wiping it off, the um, the fuzz that kind of built, built up throughout the embroidery process um, doesn't go away completely. So I will dust it off with some canned air then wipe it clean, then put it back onto my machine. You do not want to use this and uh, use the canned air in your bobbin case or around your feed dogs. If you want to dust off the top of your machine, staying clear of your thread guides or dust off um, the top of your machine that holds your thread spools, canned air is great for that. So just air on the side of caution when using the canned air but it's great for other things too, like, of course, your computer keyboard um, and other things around your sewing room as well. So we have this as well at sulky.com. It's a great product. All right, this is um, our uh, Embroiderer's Stitchers set, I believe is what it's called. And what I like about this little toolkit First off, it comes in a cute little zippered container and I'm a sucker for the container, but it includes these four attachments for little screwdrivers. So if you're always looking for a tiny screwdriver, I know you're out there. I am always looking for the tiny one that I know I have somewhere. This one has four attachments, perfect for removing your throat plate, for getting into that bottom area of your machine that collects all the lint and the stray threads, 
particularly if you have an automatic thread cutter. I really thought this was fascinating when Eric was talking to us because he said lots of machines that have auto thread cutters actually deposit a tiny little cut end of thread down there near your bobbin case where you can't see it or reach it. I know, I was horrified to learn this. I'm not saying it happens with every machine. I'm just saying he has seen that a lot with that particular type of technology or function in certain machines. So also, I'm not a super big advocate of trying to dismantle your entire machine yourself. So that's not why I'm talking about these particular little screwdrivers. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying to get into your throat plate area, you know, there's these four little screws and um, there's little screws everywhere. Screws that are holding your needle in place. Screws that are holding your uh, foot ankle in place. If you misplace that or if you are always looking for a small screwdriver, you can get this set, label it so that it's for your sewing room so nobody else can touch it. If you say this is my embroiderer's kit, nobody's going to take it away and use it for their eyeglasses and you'll never see it again. <laughs> so... Ooh, this is another great product when you're cleaning in and around your sewing machine. This is called the bird's nest tool. It's a little bit difficult to see, but again, comes in a nice little case, so nobody's going to run off with it. What you can see here on this end to the left is kind of a long pointy tool. This is specifically designed to get in and clean out those bird nest threads that you may have. So if you experience that a lot, or if you want a tool to kind of clean in and around that bobbin area to get rid of, um, you know, thread balls and thread nests, this is a great tool for that. It's always great to use a tool that is designed for the job so that you don't risk scratching up your machine or breaking a little piece of plastic off or something like that, that's then going to maybe cost you upwards of a couple hundred dollars to replace. And God forbid it disables your machine, right? So these are some of the great tools I wanted to talk about today. Slimline storage boxes. Again, these are 25% off right now. You can purchase them empty and use them to store your thread spools. We have them for the smaller snap spools. We also have them si sized for the larger king spools. I'm trying to find one here. Oh goodness, for the larger king spools. So very important to keep your thread spools out of dust, dirt, debris, make them last longer, what I also like about the slimline storage box is it opens up completely flat. If you want to install hooks in your sewing room, you can open them up flat when you're working on projects and easily see all the colors, and then you can close them up and hang them on the same hook. You can also take them apart and put them back together. So really great way to store your thread and these are on sale. Okay, so let's make sure there's no one um, in here with questions so far before we get to the project at hand. Everyone's saying very important to clean the machine. All right. Linda wants me to explain the difference between the minis and the other sizes of thread spools. So by minis, I'm assuming you're saying the snap spools. All right, so honestly, the difference is the size and how much thread it holds. Um, all sulky threads have these snap ends for you to store your thread ends. You wrap them around that little um, groove and then snap it shut and it works for either end. So whether you're getting a snap spool or a king spool, you are still able to do this. So here is a king spool and I just 
insert my fingernail, pop this open, and I can store my thread end nice and neatly in the top. So honestly, that's the difference. Snap spool, king spool, it's all about size and how much thread. Okay. Lots of cool tools. Oh, good point. Amy is saying, I would guess some of these tools are for drop-in bobbin machines, front load bobbins, the whole bobbin case comes apart. So that is super lucky because you can really get in there and clean things out and use that handy dandy lint brush um, for that front load bobbin machine. So yes, good point. All machine brands are gonna have different little nuances that kind of set them apart from each other. So just keep in mind, you know, what you have. Always consult your manual as well if you're going to clean your machine. Anytime you're gonna remove something like a throat plate or the bobbin race, you wanna make sure you're putting it back together properly. I like to snap a photo on my phone before I touch anything. This also applies to tension adjustments. If I'm doing a manual tension adjustment, I snap a picture of where it was before so that I can go back easily if and when I need to. So just take a quick picture before you start, um, you know, fiddling with your bobbin area just to make sure everything's going back <laughs> properly. Okay. Pam wants to know if there's a case for the big spools of filleting thread. There is not a case for those. Um, I will just say yet, because you may have sparked an idea, Pam. We'll find out. Linda says, my snap ends tend to break off. What should I do to prevent that from happening? Well, the only thing I can say, and you're probably not going to like this answer, is to just be really ginger with it. And when you are opening up the snap end, start with one side first and then get the other side open. If you go to grab the whole thing and pull it, it might break off. So you wanna do one side and then the other. Hopefully that helps. Okay, lots of people asking how many spools of thread that the cases hold. Great questions. Let me just make sure I'm speaking intelligently about it. Um, the different sizes, the ones that hold snap spools, um, are obviously going to hold a little bit uh, less than the ones that hold snap spools. So let me just double check. You can also go to the links I posted in the description of today's post. Um, and shop around. If you're not seeing it, you might need to hit the little see more button and then you'll be able to see all the links. I posted a lot of links today. All right, so the snap end spool, that slimline will hold up to 104 spools. If you get the king size one, hold please. I am scrolling, here we go. Which is also referred to as the universal storage box. This one holds up to 64 large and small snap end spools. So there you go. If you have a variety of different sizes of thread spools, you'll want to get that universal one. If you have all of the small snap spools, like a bunch of cotton petites, or if you've taken advantage of our 50 weight cotton that's now available on snap spools, then grab that smaller uh, snap spool slimline container. All right, let's see. Martha says, how often should you give your machine a good cleaning? Great question. So when we had Eric on the program, he said at least once a year, you should take it in for service and cleaning, like a deep clean, thorough clean. However, 
after a big project, let's say you did, you know, 30 embroideries on, you know, several different jackets or something like that, you will want to take your lint brush and get in your bobbin area and in those feed dogs and just kind of dust it off, especially if you worked with a cotton thread or a textured filleting thread or another specialty thread. Or if you have that auto cutter feature on your machine, I would suggest going in there after every project and just delinting everything. That will keep your machine running so nice and smooth and you won't have to think, when was the last time I did this? Because you're doing it after every project. Then it becomes part of your routine. If you can't remember the last time you did that, it's time to do it for sure. Okay. Ooh, Barb. Very, very organized, Barb. Barb keeps a monthly planner by her machine and she logs each time she cleans it as well as her completed projects. So that's great. Okay. And Georgia, yes. Important to keep bobbin case clean as well as upper tension. Fantastic. All right. And I'm sorry for the spammy comments. We are going to take care of those straight away. Okay. Let's see. We're going to get to our sewing machine cover project of the day. So this one features a uh, partial jelly roll of fabrics. A jelly roll is a bunch of different fabric prints in two and a half inch widths, um, usually by width of fabric. I had a bunch of these left over, so I grabbed up jelly rolls in the same color family and decided to use them for my sewing machine cover. So I'll show you the cover I first made that I've had forever. And this is out of one fabric, one fabric on the front, one, the same fabric on the back. So and I believe this was just a yard of fabric that I cut in half. And so I used a half yard for the front and a half yard for the back. So if you want to go ahead and work with one fabric to do this, by all means, do so. I just decided to change it up a bit, put a little more technique into it, and piece together these leftover jelly rolls that I had. Um, plus, I love the color orange. All right, so let's start off with the first part of the tutorial. Like I said, full instructions for this tutorial are linked in the description of today's post. So you can head on over to our free projects page. You will have to enter your email to get there. If you have already entered your email on our free project page, don't worry, you will not get duplicate um, emails into your inbox, okay? So if you're already signed up, I don't know why, but you still have to give your email um, even if you've already done it before. So now that that is squared away, you will find the sewing machine cover project that you can print out or save to your computer. But here we go. I'm going to go over it here and you can send me all of your questions that you have as we go along. Now, here's the thing. You can make this for a sewing machine. You can make this for your serger. You can make this for just about anything. All you have to do is take accurate measurements. So I measure up and over the top of my machine. That is obviously, oh, and I should mention that half yard might not work for your machine. So this cover does not fit my designer Epic 2. It fits my smaller Husqvarna Viking machine. So just so you're aware, you may need more than half a yard of fabric. So very important to measure your machine to make sure that you account for enough fabric. All right, so measure up and over your machine around the whitest part. So if you have an embroidery machine that has um, a um, touch screen, it's probably thicker on that end of the machine. So keep that in mind. All right, so after you measure, you will write down the dimensions that you need for your large rectangle. 
It's going to go up and over the machine. And then you also might need to measure the depth just to make sure you are allowing for enough sort of ease to go up and over. Then you will measure from side to side to know, you know, how wide you need your rectangle to be. So then it is time to do the embroidery. This is a design from OESD. Um, I think it's from their sister site, which is Scissor Tail Stitches. The design is linked in the PDF. So if you grab the PDF for this project, um, you can go straight to grab this design if you like it as well. It's kind of a tattoo art style, little birdie with the, you know, needle and thread. I thought it was cute. I completely changed the colors of this design to match my fabrics. So you all know you could do that, right? <laughs> you don't have to stick to the color palette from the digitizer or from the designer. You can change things up. Have fun with it. So I just looked at the design on my machine screen, figured out which thread went where, and sort of re-colored uh, it to match my fabrics. So. After you do your embroidery, which if you're wondering what stabilizer I used for this, I used Sulky's Soft and Sheer Extra. It is a fusible uh, cutaway stabilizer. And since I was working with quilting cotton here, this is just a like off-white Kona cotton that I used for the pocket. I like to use a solid for most of my embroideries or a very subtle print so that you can really see the design and the stitching. Since it was off-white and rather, you know, you can see my ironing board cover through it, right? So I added that soft and sheer extra and I'm leaving it with the pocket for the whole construction. I am not cutting it away close to the design. I'm actually using it to interface the entire pocket piece. So you'll want to cut your fabric large enough so that you can create the entire pocket out of it, not just the pocket front. And then use the Soft and Sheer Extra for not only your embroidery stabilizer, but also for your pocket interfacing. So once your embroidery is complete, you'll want to press your hoop marks out. Be careful because it is a fusible stabilizer. Um, you don't wanna use a bunch of steam. You don't want your stabilizer to pucker up on you. You've already fused it to the fabric, so we're just pressing it gently to get rid of those hoop markings. Then we will fold that rectangle in half with right sides together. You can kind of see the embroidery underneath there because I have folded it. And then stitch along the upper edge. After stitching the upper edge, you can trim that seam allowance. So I believe I used a quarter inch seam allowance for everything that I'll be talking about uh, for the entire construction. And then for this pocket, I trimmed that upper edge to about an eighth of an inch and then clipped my corners so that I would have really nice uh, corners and um, upper edge once I turn the pocket right side out. So then I turn the pocket right side out and I top stitch a quarter inch away from that upper edge as just kind of a decorative finish. And you can see I've used an orange uh, 50 weight cotton thread to do my top stitching. Now you might be wondering, how is this a pocket? The side and lower edge are still raw. Well, those are going to be encased in the binding that we put on the sewing machine cover. So there's no need to finish them now. If we had finished them and turned them right side out, it would add bulk to that binding seam. So instead, we're gonna keep it nice and flat and leave that side seam raw for now. So give this a good press along the opposite side, which has been folded, so that it is um, nice and defined for you. So now the pocket is done. Isn't that cute? We're going to set it aside and we're going to work on the piecing. So, I pieced this um, at a about 45 degree angle. So what I did in order to do that was I got my largest cutting mat and I just started placing my jelly roll strips next to each other on point or on a 45 degree-ish 
angle. And I put all the prints next to each other that I wanted to kind of change up the pattern a little bit until I had roughly the size that I needed according to my measurements that I took. You could see I had to piece some of them together to make them long enough. Another thing you can do is if you don't have a super large cutting mat, you can actually use masking tape on your dining room table or your work table and tape out your finished dimensions and then place your strips along your masked uh, rectangle, making sure that there is enough for seam allowances, right? So it will need to extend beyond your masking tape or painter's tape or whatever you want to use by a, at least a half inch to give yourself room to groove. So once you've kind of plotted that out, you can start sewing them together along their long edges until you have a rectangle that kind of looks like this. Then we will go in and trim the rectangle to our dimensions. Now, I did forget to mention, when you're taking your dimensions, you will be adding some seam allowance, okay? So all of that is in the PDF. You will have instructions for that. But just don't forget these things um, while you're moving along as well. <clears throat> seam allowance, very important, especially when you are um, piecing the top because then you need additional fabric strips to account for all of those seam allowances. Again, if you're making this out of just solid fabric or a couple of fabrics or scraps that you have, you know, adjust for that. Do your little masking tape trick and kind of piece together your top um, and or plot the positions for your fabrics that way. Okay, so now we've got the top. Now, if you want to do the back side or the inside of your sewing machine cover in the same way, you would just repeat this process. You could even do another color of jelly roll strips on the opposite side, and then you'd have like a reversible cover and you could change up your print or your color depending on your mood, depending on the holidays, that type of thing. So I just used a solid fabric for the inside of mine. So it's entirely up to you what you would like to do for yours. But again, you can make it reversible by, um, well, it is reversible. So you can just change up the fabrics however you wish. All right, so after the front is pieced, we're gonna kinda set it aside, cut your backing to about the same dimensions. And now we're going to make the ties. The ties, hold your uh, cover around the sides of your machine. So we're gonna create four ties and I use some scraps for these. So they, they're a little frayed and whatnot. So, you know, it's all good. You could also use a serger to make this by the way. Um, serge all your strips together, press them to one side, serge your ties together. Um, it's really cool to use a serger to create little narrow ties like this because you can start off with a long serger tail and actually use that to pull your tie right side out. So that is super helpful. All right, so you're going to sew the sh one short end and the long edge of all four of your ties. And then I happen to have a knitting needle close by. That's what I used to turn my tubes right side out. Again, you could use that serger chain or you can use a, a chopstick um, or some kind of point turner. So you'll turn all of those right side out. Ooh, that's a very large image. Hold please. Let's see. Let's make that a little smaller. Okay, you can see me turning those that right side out there. Once you have all of your ties right side out, give them a good press press that long edge seam towards one side, and then we will be setting aside our ties. All right, so now you're gonna take that front piece and position, or actually no, we don't position the pocket yet. Hold on, hold on. 
No, we've got to do our quilting first. I'm so sorry, I'm ahead of myself. So before adding the pocket, you're gonna create your quilt sandwich. Use some KK2000, um, that's our temporary spray adhesive. It's air soluble, it's more environmentally friendly than you may expect. And um, I use it for almost all of my uh, quilt basting. Especially a smaller project like this, I didn't use a single pin. I sprayed the back of my pieced top with the KK, put it onto my batting, then sprayed the backing fabric and put it on the other side of my batting and I was ready to quilt. You can quilt this in any way that you like. So for my solid fabric cover, I quilted it by just sewing on the diagonal on either side of the little fabric motif. I thought that was so cute. You could also just go straight down. Uh, you could free motion quilt this. You could just go crazy with the quilting. It's entirely up to you. For this one, I just quilted in the ditch along every one of my diagonal seams. And then um, on the opposite side, it almost looks similar to this, you know, my diagonal uh, quilting lines. So go ahead and quilt that. Oh, and my in my picture here, you can see me indicating it's a little dark, but on my machine, I have a little laser light option. I always forget that it's there, but it is really handy when you're quilting in the ditch because you put your little laser light and it shows you where the light is headed. So if it is headed along your seam line, then you're not going to stray from your ditch quilting line. So I just thought that was something helpful to show you all. All right, so after our quilting is complete, then we are going to place our pocket. So like I said earlier, that side and the lower edge of the pocket are raw. So I use my handy dandy Clover quilting clips um, or Clover wonder clips to clip it to um, basically my quilted um, cover. So just along that side and lower edge. And then I'm going to baste it in place along those raw edges. <clears throat> Again, that's going to be encased in our binding. So just a basting stitch. You wanna um, lengthen your stitch length to about 5.0 for that. Then we're going to top stitch that finished edge. So make sure when you adjust to your top stitching, make your um, stitch length go back to its standard setting of about 2.5 and top stitch that edge of the pocket in place. So. Now we are good to continue. I've got a, some comments, so let's address those real quick before we move forward. Um, Sharon is saying you should trim it to size first. Thank you, Sharon. I also forgot that. After you do the quilting, want to trim it up before you add your pocket. That way you have nice clean edges and you're not gonna cut off a portion of your pocket when you go to add your binding. So thank you so much. And yes, there are specialty feet for stitching in the ditch. If you happen to have an add-on accessory pack with your sewing machine, you might have a ditch quilting foot or a stitch in the ditch foot. So that is um, a really, really great option as well. And Marjean says you could do the other side with a more plain fabric and have a fancy cover stitch um, cover something in a contrasting color. So yes, there are lots of different options. Okay. All right, Sharon says, why not stitch and flip on a rectangle of muslin? You can certainly do the project that way if you like. This is just one method of doing it. There are tons of different ways you could finish this. So 
by all means, if you prefer a different method or technique, try that out. Um, it, it's a great project for experimenting, right? Because we are the ones who are really going to enjoy it the most. <laughs> it's in our sewing room. It's covering our um, sewing machine. So it's totally up to you how to personalize it, the uh, quilting you want to do, the embroidery you want to do. You could forego the pocket entirely if you want. Um, so completely up to you. All right, so let's get back to, let me make sure I'm on the right photo here. All right, so after our quilting is complete, our pocket is stitched on, um, we're going to baste the ties in place. So the little tie ends, um, I believe I measured about a third of the way for both of them, and that's where I placed them you might want to go ahead and put your cover on your machine first and eyeball or pin mark where you want your ties to go. You might have a larger um, top portion of your machine, so you want your ties to go a little bit lower. Um, you might have a um, hand wheel that sticks out more than most, so you might want your ties to fit right underneath that hand wheel. So by all means, Place the cover over your machine first, plot where you want your ties to go, and then you're just going to baste them in place. The ends of your ties are also going to be encased by the binding, so just a quick basting stitch is really all you need for that. All right, so I'm going to go over how to use packaged binding, so pre-made bias binding, for this project. Now, I know, I know, if you would like to make your own and really beautify this thing, by all means, make your own binding. I get a lot of questions about how to work with pre-made binding, so I'm going to go over it with you here. If you get the PDF, you will get more instructions for um, how to do uh, the binding using packages of binding. This is what I happen to have on hand. And I actually really liked the gray color with the cover. So that's what I went with. So first off, you're going to open up an end of the binding and trim it at a 45 degree angle. That gives us a nice clean finished edge. And this is going to be what I'm going to call our binding beginning. All right. So along the binding beginning, you're going to Fold that edge toward the wrong side. And you can see the long edge toward the left or upper edge of the screen. You have to fold that end in towards itself so that you don't have a raw corner point poking out of your binding. So you sort of fold it in on itself um, after you have folded that cut edge toward the wrong side. And I used uh, wonder clips here because when I was taking a photo, uh, the fold was not as crisp and nice as I wanted it to be. And I didn't want to press it too much so that you could see all the fold lines um, in the binding. So that's why I used the wonder clips in this photo. So once you have folded that end, then you are going to fold along the original fold lines those long edges toward the center. So those are folded along the factory fold lines. And then you can just clip that again to make sure it's not going anywhere. If you would like, you can top stitch that end um, as well. Uh, but I just keep it folded and I hand sew the end of my binding shut later. So that's up to you as well. So. Now our binding is ready to add to our cover. So I begin stitching about four inches away from that folded prepared end along one of the long edges of my cover. So you can clip using the wonder clips or pin your binding in place and start sewing. Now, here's what I get all the questions about. When you get to the corner, you're going to stop 
stitching a scant quarter inch from the corner. Remove your work from under the presser foot and you're going to fold that long binding up over itself at a 45 degree angle. And you can see that fold is at the 45 um, against the corner of the piece. So you will fold it up over itself at an angle and then fold it back down, meeting up that long edge with the adjacent edge of your project. Hopefully that makes sense. Now, another reason I like to use packaged binding to show people this technique is because all of these fold lines are very apparent and we are stitching the binding along that long edge fold line. It gives us a really nice indicator of where to sew our seam line. So really great for beginners. All right, now we have clipped our adjacent edge in place and you are going to place your needle into the work along just past your previous stitching line after you have pivoted the work. So our, we are sinking our needle. You can see my presser foot is still up so that I can see everything. Make sure your needle is positioned so that you are not going to sew over your previous um, fold, that 45 degree fold. It's just slightly past. Then put your presser foot down, continue sewing until you get to the next corner, and then you will repeat. At every single corner, you're going to have this little flappy piece. All right, so that is mitering the corners. Once all of that is done, you're going to fold your binding around or wrap your binding around the raw edge of the cover. And as you can see, I'm covering up the raw edge of my ties. I'm covering up the raw edges of my pocket. And I'm using those great little wonder clips to secure everything. And that factory fold line along the middle of the binding is snug up against the edge of my sewing machine cover. So everything is nice and flat. So once I have clipped everything, you may be asking, what do you do at the corners? You're going to have this little flappy piece. Along the front side of your work, it will look like a nice little mitered corner. This is what it will look like along the front side of your work. Along the back side of your work, when you're wrapping it towards the back side, See how I've created that 45 degree angle again with my fold because of the way I constructed it along the top of my sewing machine cover? So you will fold along that line and then wrap that binding over and there you have your little mitered corner edge along the back side as well. So prepare all four corners that way. There we go. There's our little mitered fold along the back side. Now, before I get to this, this might be controversial for some of you, but I think it's a really great way to finish up binding when you want to do it by machine. I am not a big proponent of machine sewn binding, you know, for finishing, um, for finishing it. I, for the most part, for quilts always, hand sew the binding fold along the backing of my project. It's just a nicer, cleaner finish, and you don't have any errant stitches or stitches that haven't secured that binding fold when you are stitching from the top side of the work. But what I have discovered is using sulky invisible thread and setting my machine for a zigzag stitch and I'm using invisible thread in the needle and invisible thread in the bobbin. That way, when I sew my binding 
from the right side of the work because you really always want to sew it from the right side to make sure that your stitching is really pretty from the pretty side of the work. If you're sewing a zigzag stitch, you are always going to catch the bind the back side of that binding fold in your stitches. And when you use sulky invisible thread for this, you cannot tell unless you are up close and personal with it that it was even zigzag stitched at all. So this is kind of my binding hack for those of us who want to uh, complete the project in an afternoon and not have to hand sew the binding or uh, machine sew it and risk, you know, not catching the binding fold um, in the stitching along the back side of the work. So I know you all can weigh in on my use of um, invisible thread here. Sorry, I've got to find my place again um, so that I can get back to the tutorial. Here we go. All right, so I set my machine for a zigzag. 3.5 is the uh, width and 3.0 is the length that I chose for this. You can go a little bit narrower if you would like. Again, I used invisible thread in the needle and invisible thread in the bobbin. When you are winding your bobbin with invisible thread, you need to slow down your machine speed or ease up on the foot pedal when you're winding the bobbin and only wind it about a third of the way full. You really don't need that much thread in the bobbin to bind this project. Like I said, most of them are gonna be about a half of a yard um, size-wise. So you probably don't even need the whole third of, third of a bobbin. But at any rate, less thread, um, slower speed means less tension and less chance of stretching that thread while it's being wound. So here is my zigzag stitch and I'm sewing from the right side of, of or is this the right side or the wrong side? I can't even tell. At any rate, with the invisible thread, you could sew from the right side or the wrong side and it's going to be invisible. So, beautiful little tip. All right, once you have all of your binding attached, so, can anyone see my invisible thread? This is the right side. This is the wrong side. You cannot see it. Isn't that great? I just love this little tip. Actually did that um, for the first cover that I made as well. Cannot see my invisible thread. And I used twill tape for the binding of this one because that is what I had on hand and it totally worked for the binding as well. Okay, a lot of people are saying I would use a decorative stitch in a variegated color. That's a great idea for the binding. You could use a really pretty decorative stitch along the edge, a star stitch or something like that. And since the needle is going every which way to create those decorative stitches, you can be assured that your binding fold is going to be attached along the back side. All right, yay for invisible thread binding. <laughs> All right, Linda says the back side of a mitered corner is so difficult to get correct. Any tips? So I'm gonna try to go back to the photo I had of the back side of the binding. Oops, that's not it. Bear with me a moment. Okay, so here's how we got there. So you have your little flappy piece, right? So the edge that you have folded toward the back side and you're clipping, right? Let the other edge go so that when you fold it, you can see that little 45 degree angle along your adjacent edge. Finger press that a little bit. Then when you fold the adjacent edge over, match up your folded edges. You might have to finagle it just a little bit depending on how it was trimmed or how it was sewn at the corner. And then fold that over to the uh, back side 
and you'll have your little mitered corner showing. So hopefully that makes sense. It's really difficult to um, give a tutorial on binding, I will say. Uh, <laughs> I have been trying to explain it in different ways for years. There are a lot of different ways you can um, bind a quilty project. Um, and I'm working on a project right now that you guys will see in a few weeks where I do a totally different binding technique as well. Um, there are also instances where you can, if you're not quilting the piece a lot, um, you can cut your backing fabric larger than your front and actually wrap your backing fabric twice over um, towards the front of your work and use your backing as your binding as well. So there are so many different ways of doing it, but I just thought I would show you if you're using prepackaged binding or even making your own. And this is really, from what I, from my experience, the more traditional way of binding a quilty project and getting those nice crisp, crisp mitered corners. All right, so then your item is complete. Once you have, um, oh, some people are asking too, so how do we finish the binding along the beginning? All right, so you know how we started sewing our binding about four inches from that nice folded edge that we created. So what I do is as I am reaching that point, as I'm reaching the binding beginning, I overlap the binding end a couple of inches beyond the binding beginning. And that folded edge is going to be what is facing the right side. So our binding end gets folded together with the binding beginning, trim it off, and then when you wrap it to the wrong side, the, the uh, binding end is inside the binding beginning. So you'll unfold it, wrap it around itself, and you have that nice folded edge that you used Wonder Clips for. And then when you're all done, you can hand sew that little edge um, using a slip stitch or ladder stitch or some sort of invisible stitch or a couple tacking stitches, and it will look seamless. So. That is how you would finish um, the binding end inside of the binding beginning. And some people are asking for video on this. Um, we have a sped up video. Um, it's like a time lapse video of doing binding on our YouTube channel. It's this exact tutorial that I'm explaining to you here in photos. So if you do want a video, that is a very sped up version. Okay, that's for um, the quick YouTuber who is wants a general overview. So here um, I explained it more in detail. You can head on over to our YouTube channel and watch that um, quickie video of how to do binding. Okay. And again, all of that is written out in the PDF for this project. So you can have visual cues and some written instructions for how to do that that may be a little easier to follow than what I'm telling you here today. Yes, binding is in a category of its own. <laughs> okay, so again, once your, um, once your cover is completed, you just simply tie it around your machine. It's as simple as that. So I put my ties so they would go underneath my hand wheel. Um, that's probably a good rule of thumb for um, your design as well. And here it is on my sewing table. It's got my quilting ruler and a good pair of sewing scissors in there. But again, you could store the tools you are using for the project you're working on and then when you get to another project, swap out the tools that you need for that one. That would be a really great way to stay organized. And I am trying to get better at that, especially in these times of spring cleaning and refreshing and renewing. So um, I hope you all enjoyed the tutorial of uh, the sewing machine cover and that you are 
uh, inspired to make sure to get your machine serviced, clean out any of those little um, lint areas or stray threads in and around your machine. And always, always, after you have cleaned your machine, install a new sewing machine needle. If you can't remember the last time you changed out your sewing machine needle, now is the time. Also, think about your serger as well. Those needles also need to be replaced. A lot of people don't use their sergers as much as they use their sewing machines, so it's not really top of mind to change out those needles, but it's also very important to do that as well. All right. Okay. I'll just show you all the photo of the project again. Lots of you saying you love the embroidery design. So again, you can get the link for that design um, if you download the PDF of the project on our free project page and go straight and purchase it. Again, grab all of those great tools from Sulky to make sure that you keep your machine in tip top shape. Don't forget those slimline boxes are on sale. 25% off the empty slimline boxes so you can store your thread, keep it away from light and lint and dust and um, make your sewing room a happy, happy place. So grab up all these good deals today. Let me know how you like your sewing machine project. And again, our goodie today for one lucky viewer who is liking, commenting, otherwise engaging with the post today is our bobbin cleaner tool. So this is today's little gifty for one lucky viewer. So make sure, sure you are sharing, liking, giving me those emojis. And I so appreciate talking with all of you all the time. I love all of your comments. I love to hear from you. If something was not addressed today and you need an answer, please email us at info at sulky.com and we would be happy to assist you. Also in the description of today's post, um, is a link for our next free webcast. Our webcast is called Americana Cross Stitch. It is with Amanda Mae McNaughton of Ardeth Design. She is a floss tuber and cross stitch expert, and she will be going through a really great patriotic cross stitch pattern and showing you lots of different ways to display it, uh, to add to your home decor, um, just in time for Memorial Day and all of our summer holidays, 4th of July, and all that good stuff. So you can register now for that webcast to be sure to reserve your spot. I link directly to it in the description of today's post. So I hope to see you all during the webcast on May 11th, 2 p.m. Eastern Time. I'll be talking more about that as the weeks go on, but I wanted to give you all a sneak peek first glimpse of the next webcast so you can prepare and get that on your calendar. So again, thank you so much for joining me today and I will see you next week for another So What?